on this Thursday morning where the humidity is ripe. And so are we. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning, John. Good morning, sir. And Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Good to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you. How are you feeling? I feel great. You look great. As always. A little dressed well. No vest today. Well, it's hot out there. It's yeah, humid. It is that. It's, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. humid. Yeah. It'll be in the 80s and humid today. I, it's probably t-shirt, like tank top weather. <laughs> Come in. Huh. Not in the courtroom, though. <laughs> yeah, you don't see a lot of prosecutors in tank tops. You just you don't. Know, at least not on television. You They're should. Not, yeah. You know, you really should. Uh, you know, maybe back in the 70s, it sounds like a Love Boat episode or something like that with the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. They were always on the Love Boat for some reason. Never in Texas, yeah. always on the Love Boat. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Freddy, you know what I'm talking about. The Love Boat was a television was a show. Well, I remember television. I mean, I'm not... Love, <laughs> exciting and new. I just d- don't remember that. Come aboard. I remember that it We're was on, but I also you. just remember not watching it. Oh, how could you not watch The Love Boat? <laughs> it's think, love, exciting and new. I think you're answering the question for <laughs> that's, me. That's where television stars knew that they were washed up when they, you, <laughs> when, they, when they found themselves in The Love there Boat. There in Fantasy Island. Yes, that's, that's those right. Those are the two shows no, that I left. I watch Fantasy Island. Sonny Bono, I think, made the record of a number of guest appearances on those shows there. Um, Joe Ferretti by telephone. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning. And Rob, I'm always fascinated about the way your mind works. Don't be. <laughs> be disappointed by it. Don't be or, or concerned. <laughs> fascinated and impressed are two or different long. things. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get them confused. <laughs> well, you know, the idle, the idle mind gets two hours to fill it every single day, except on weekends when it's 24. Uh, it is the, in all seriousness, 80th commemoration of D-Day. Uh, in, in and of itself, June 6, 1944. The survivors, and there are less than 200 now, of those who uh, were there June 6, 1944 in the invasion, are between the ages now of 95 and 107. Tim Murphy, who's a retired Marine, has been on the show many times, sent me an 11-page document about this uh, overnight, haven't had a chance to get through the entire thing, but that was some of the highlights of it as uh, they are comm- uh, commemorating this, again, 80th year on uh, on this June 6, 2024. And, and probably everybody in our audience at some point along the way has seen the entire movie, The Saving Private Ryan, or at least the opening scene, which is as intense as uh, a movie war scene, I think, can get. And Joe, I know the first time I saw Saving Private Ryan, that opening scene, I was just completely blown away by the intensity of that. And that was just movie intensity. That's obviously not the real thing. Oh, yeah, that, that was uh, uh, remarkable filmmaking and something that uh, if you when you remember seeing it for the first time, you, you realize that 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 imagery will, will stick with you. Uh, and and I, I just finished watching uh, for probably the second or third time Band of Brothers mm-hmm. and uh, another remarkable achievement in cinematography. And, I, you know, one one statement, one quote from that series stuck with me and, and it, every time I watch it I, I, you get chills when uh, there was uh, the attack on, on Pearl Harbor and it was clear that we were getting uh, involved in the European theater uh, to liberate Europe from Nazi domination uh, there were young men who were committing suicide because their enlistment efforts were being rejected by the armed services. Imagine that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that tells you <laughs> the tenor of the times in our country that uh, that was taking place. And, and that is something that uh, I'll never forget. We also have to understand that at, at that point in time, that was my, my dad's era. He actually was in flight training when the war ended. Uh, he was in the Navy. But the enlistment then was for the duration plus six months. So after VE Day, when when the Germans surrendered, those guys were gearing up now to go over to Japan, you know, to the Pacific Theater to fight over there too. And it just happenstance, well, happenstance and 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 a lot of strategy that that war ended. But those guys had no expectation of ever coming home again. You know, it's just, they they all expected that they were just going off to war and dying, and they did it willingly and. And as you say, Joe, it was it was a with with honor. It was it was dishonor to not be able to go. What it is hard to imagine these days. 
you haven't seen the Apple TV series Masters of the Air, that's another one where it's uh, about World War II bomber pilots. And I know, John, you and I and Bill had talked about this program when it was in its run as intense as it gets from in the air. And, mm-hmm. and those uh, scenes there is just uh, gripping television. It is uh, as good as television can be in uh, that situation. Masters of the Air is what it's called. But, Joe, that's not the reason why you're on the phone uh, with us this morning. And this has to do with a case, uh, Matt Harvey, your office was involved in trying as well. And Joe, maybe you can familiarize us, uh, our audience with the case a little bit before we start to get into it, if you want to take a moment. Yes, and, and, and uh, we're fortunate uh, to have Matt Harvey in the studio to uh, uh, provide uh, a lot greater detail than I can uh, since his office handled the case. And, and I, first of all, I respect Matt for his uh, willingness to do so. Uh, we realized, Rob, when we scheduled this slot that uh, Matt was going to be one of the co-hosts today. And uh, I reached out to Matt and said, hey, we're going to be talking about this case. And he, uh, he certainly expressed his willingness to discuss it, and I, I appreciate that. And the judge, uh, by well. the way, is what, your former law partner, David Hammer, correct? Yeah, another angle on this one, exactly. I, I, somebody who I practiced law with for, for over 30 years. So uh, uh, as a case that, that uh, uh, I was following a little bit, and those of us who follow uh, courtroom action uh, here locally, we, we certainly uh, keep our eye on things like this. And, and a fascinating case and from the perspective of a lawyer. Now, certainly a, a tragic case in terms of the fact that uh, somebody died in, in a motor vehicle accident. And and really, in summary, what happened here was uh, there was a, a an intersection collision over in Ranson, uh, an intersection that all of us are familiar with. It's Route 9 and, and uh, Oakley Drive, which is where the five guys in Chick-fil-A and those places are located there along the uh, uh, very busy four-lane corridor. There was an intersection collision. Uh, an individual named Eugene Weatherholt uh, was driving a Ford F-350, which is a very large pickup truck. And uh, according to the investigative reports that were uh, produced and compiled by both the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department and the Ransom City Police, Mr. Weatherholt uh, ran a red light and struck a vehicle in which a, a young lady named Alana Williams was a, a uh, occupant. Uh, She uh, tragically uh, died as a result of the collision. And uh, what transpired afterwards was an investigation, uh, not only by the police, but of course, uh, Matt Harvey's uh, office over there, Jefferson County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, A charge was brought against Mr. Weatherholt for uh, reckless driving, causing death. Uh, It's uh, we, we liken that to involuntary manslaughter. And uh, so that that case was tried here within the past week or so in the Jefferson County Circuit Court, Judge Hammer presiding. And what happened was uh, after the prosecution presented their witnesses and evidence and rested their case from the bench, Judge Hammer uh, ruled uh, upon motion of the defendant, I believe, that there was uh, that the case was appropriate for a judgment of acquittal under Rule 29 of the West Virginia Rules of Criminal Procedure. And that's where a judge essentially decides that there is insufficient evidence to prove the elements of the charge. And the judge has the prerogative at that stage of the proceedings to dismiss the case with prejudice if if the judge, in his or her opinion, believes that the case can't be made. uh, That's what Judge Hammer did, so the case was dismissed. And... Uh, of course, uh, th- there are repercussions for that, uh, you know, of course, for the family of the deceased. Uh, I'm sure they were disappointed by the result. Uh, prosecutor's office and, and Matt Harvey, I'm sure, were disappointed as well. But uh, it is something that, w- you know, when these cases get tried, um, you know, they, they are they are put to the test. And sometimes uh, uh, you don't succeed. And, and that's just a matter of uh a trial work, but uh, that was the result of the case, and I thought it was interesting, Rob, because from a couple of different perspectives, uh, it's important to understand the interplay here of both criminal and civil law, and also uh, to to gain a better understanding as to how a case can be dismissed before it's ever presented to the jury. So it's dismissed on a lack of evidence, as, well, as I understand, Matt Harvey. Is that correct? <laughs> The, the evidence that was presented didn't meet the elements is the, in the judge's estimation. It's not 
and just to be real clear, we're not talking about we forgot to introduce a witness or something was missed. It wasn't a, like a technical. It was that what we had. And we, we were able to introduce everything that we that we we wanted to. So we got all of our evidence in that we had. And in the judge's estimation, it wasn't enough to meet the, the elements. What were the required elements? Well, it, it, we know that he was operating a vehicle. We know that he was operating the vehicle that struck and killed uh, Alana Williams. Um, so... You know who and and what and where and when is 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 taken care of. It's was he operating in a reckless disregard of of the safety of others, and that is, I mean, that's a very subjective standard. Wouldn't running a red light, in fact, satisfy well, that? I I you know this is where I respectfully disagree with the judge's decision on this one. And, um, and that's okay that we disagree. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for this judge and I'm very happy that he's in Jefferson County and that he's, he's, his difference since he's been in office is incredible. And this doesn't change, this decision doesn't change how I feel about him as far as respecting him as a person and as a judge. It, it, it's not that at all. It's, we're human beings. We have we have disagreements on well, the differences of opinion. Matt, help us understand what was missing from the. We've established the fact that a person ran a red light, struck a vehicle, and killed somebody. What are we missing in the equation that would have brought about a different well, verdict? So, a lot of things could have brought brought about a different verdict. Like, let's say he was. Uh, um, pass you know cutting through the median or going or we were able to prove that he was going 130 miles an hour that 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 we don't know what else we could that that would have been enough but we just know that this wasn't and there's then the judge didn't indicate what would have been enough to satisfy it's just that the well, judge it, only indicated there wasn't enough right right I, and i wasn't in the courtroom when this when he made his decision to be fair so um look this is this is that Negligent homicide is. I've been to Charleston three years in a row, tr per, you know, pushing for change in this law. And you know, you talking about disappointed. Even if of, I've been I've been on the other side of these where the, there has been a, a verdict of guilty and been disappointed because it's almost for nothing because the penalty is so light that there's there's really no justice for for when you can meet those hurdles and we do have hurdles and it's and you know in the grand scheme of things it's good to see that there are there are checks we're not just running willy-nilly and, and putting prosecuting people for this every time there's an accident is, is one of the issues I, I was scanning the news articles in, in the run-up just minutes before the show here and there was some question i think as to whether or not it was provable that he actually ran a red light as opposed to no, no that was i don't think that that's that was one of the issues well it, it John, there was a lot of issues, right, that the defense attorney brought up. We don't know which one was, would have been dispositive or, or favorable or, or influence a jury. We'll never know that. We don't, we're, I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But I can tell you, looking at knowing what I know about the case, because I'm the one that decided, I'm, I, me, me, I personally made the decision to charge this case as negligent homicide. Not the police, not anyone else in my office. I, I did it, and I stand by it. Um, and we came up short, and but it wasn't from lack of effort. We tried. We, and, um, but, no, that that defense, if that was what they were relying on, that that there wasn't a satisfactory evidence that the light was red his way, that would have been a total. So, when a judge failure, it, and we make it this specific, or or in general, when the judge makes a decision like this, it's not incumbent upon him to say because. I'm not convinced that these factors, these particular factors are proven. I therefore, I, I, I judge this person not guilty. Or does it, it just an aggregate statement that says I'm not convinced and you're, so no, you're they, therefore not guilty? Does judge, he have to just justify why? Not just, well, he, just, he does. Okay. He did. He, he made some statements that are there in some different articles. Again, I wasn't in the room when he made right. the statement. I'm relying on what was reported to me. And then plus what I've read in, in news reports as well. Um, but I've, I forgot where I was going to go with that, John. Joe Freddy, do you have anything additional on this one? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, everything that Matt is saying, I, I certainly agree with. Uh, but I, yeah, I think the way to look at this is, uh, okay, let, let's, uh, let's accept the idea that this uh, defendant, Mr. Weatherholt, uh, blew a red light. Uh, you know, who among us who has been driving a vehicle hasn't blown a stop sign or a red light inadvertently? Okay, we were inattentive. We, you know, we, we, our mind was was elsewhere, and and uh, we, we just didn't realize uh, that we went through an intersection where there was a stop sign or, or a red light. Uh, that that happens, and and that's inattentive. That's negligence. Uh, what I believe the courts look for is some sort of aggravating factor behind the action of blowing the red light or the stop sign. For example, was the individual uh, carrying a, a enough speed to be considered reckless, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over the speed limit. Was the individual under the influence of some sort of medication or alcohol or, or drug? Was the, That's a separate in, crime. Individual, was the individual distracted? Okay, was he looking at his cell phone, uh, texting, or trying to find the next song to play on his radio? I mean, those are things that I believe not only investigating officers look for, but the judge. And if there's an absence of any evidence to the to to support that kind of uh, uh, claim that the individual was somehow uh, acting in reckless disregard to the safety of others, then a judge could very well do what Judge Hammer did here and say, look, there's insufficient evidence to support uh, this this criminal charge, so I'm going to dismiss it. And, and I, I believe. Again, uh, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking here because I wasn't there either, but I believe that's probably what happened. Well, if anybody the, – the, 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 the seminal case on this is, if anybody's curious, wants to look Google it in West Virginia, State versus Green. It was in Hampshire County where you had a motorist that was being inattentive for, and a, a vehicle stopped in front of – this this woman and she had nine seconds to react she didn't she smashed into the back of this vehicle it killed the one of the occupants in that vehicle pushed the vehicle over into oncoming traffic and killed a motorcycle driver coming the other way and she was exceeding the speed limit by a little bit not and being was distracted by the line of motorcycles that were coming uh on the other direction so that's they and in that case the supreme court said that's not enough to, to get to that gross negligence standard that is required because they it's it's the same standard as w what we have in involuntary manslaughter and so we know that's how we're, we look at things is like well um that wasn't enough so in our set of circumstances is it enough and and i i thought it was in this case i thought it was in this case and I, I want to be clear on the differentiation in charges, Matt. We've kind of gone all around this and identified the charges in, in different segments of this. But uh, involuntary manslaughter in West Virginia versus negligent homicide, What's tell us where this parts. Negligent homicide requires a vehicle, the operation of a vehicle. We do not have a vehicular manslaughter. It, we do, but it's it's not called that. It's negligent homicide you can only get there if it's in the use of a vehicle so you know i, I get that all the time well why didn't you charge vehicular manslaughter like well I, I did i charged negligent homicide and which is our toughest penalty for something like this now if if they were intoxicated uh and they wrecked and killed someone then then you know that's a three to 15 in the penitentiary and is involuntary manslaughter a lesser charge nope it's the same it's it's just not with the vehicle just not with the vehicle okay. same penalty it's not a it's not a lesser included it's just akin to this the intent behind it is the same okay except you're using a vehicle instead of something else so matt uh i mean we're talking with matt harvey jefferson county prosecuting attorney uh, attorney at law joe ferretti whose former law partner david hammer was the judge in this particular case who did the directed verdict <coughs> excuse me so matt if you had if you had uh, specifically the dismissal is this is based on the specific charge of uh, negligent homicide had you gone for a different charge it would have had to meet a different standard i what other yes i mean it depends on what other charge what other charge were your options reckless driving that you know 500 fine speeding running a red light you know a traffic ticket 
versus so, this. I, so, so yeah. there was, so just to be clear, there were some tickets issued in this case, mm-hmm. and I instructed the, the officer to have those dismissed so I could review this for potentially charging what I see is the most serious crime it can be in this these types of circumstances, which is negligent homicide. And I did that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I told the family it was going to be tough, and they know. We've stayed in contact throughout this process. And, uh, you know, I met with them after – after the judge's ruling, again, this is not being critical towards our judge. This is sure, and another judge could have made a different decision and let it went to a jury. You know, I think in these types of cases, because we can argue about what is and what isn't negligent, what what's reckless enough to qualify. And I was, you know, it would have. I think that my personal opinion is that that's where why we have juries is we have to have that community input on what we deem as crimes. So there, there's a jury for this case, Joe and Matt, but the judge makes a directed verdict. Does that at that point override anything that the jury was working on? They weren't, they uh, weren't, they hadn't received the case yet. Had, this was between had the, the, the jury been selected. The jury had been selected. The state had put on their evidence and that's when a rule 29 motion is made by the, by the defense attorney or, okay. or the defense. You know, defense counsel, whichever it's these these this applies to civil cases as well, and then the judge makes a ruling, and let's say he you know denies it, then then the defense would have began uh, putting on their case, and then after the defense rested, they would have made another motion for Rule Twenty Nine, and you know it's not often. Mm-hmm. I, it's not often a, that a Rule 29 is entered in a criminal case, but uh, it was in this case. Mr. Ferretti? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to look at the judge's role here. Think of the judge as the gatekeeper, okay? That that person is, is vested with the power to make rulings about what evidence comes in and what, what is admissible and not admissible. And at certain stages of a trial, both in civil and criminal cases, the judge is also able to decide whether or not there is sufficient proof, whether the prosecuting attorney in this case or the plaintiff in a civil case has met their burden in terms of producing sufficient evidence to carry forward with the charges uh, to the extent then that a jury would ultimately decide innocence or guilt. And, And that's what the judge did in this case. Uh, he performed his gatekeeping functions and and declared that in his mind, after hearing the testimony of the investigating officers and the witnesses in the case, and I think there were a couple witnesses there who were at the scene, may not have seen the actual wreck, but were there, they all testified and he decided that there was not sufficient evidence to sustain the charges as a judgment call. Yep. It's much like it was a judgment call in Matt Harvey's office to bring this case. Uh, and that's what we, we, we vest these elected officials with this power to exercise that judgment. And it, it, it can be very true here that both Matt Harvey's office and the judge were correct in how this case was ultimately decided. Uh, Matt Harvey's office was correct in bringing the case. I think a lot of people would, could agree with that. And I think uh, uh, folks who look at the evidence in the case and see how it came in and how these officers testified, what evidence they were able to gather in their investigation, according to the judge, didn't meet uh, the standard of sufficiency for the charges. So it could be the case that both, both sides of this equation are correct. So is it- I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, too. So extrapolating on that, if if it, is it can a juror assume that if they actually get the case that the judge has decided that there's an implication the judge has said, well, this guy might very well be guilty. No, 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 no. That, no, that there's been sufficient evidence placed upon the record that a jury can deliberate. Yeah, and, and John, as a technical matter, these motions for a directed verdict in civil cases and motions for acquittal in, in, in criminal cases, they those motions are held outside the hearing of the jury. The jury is excused, so they have no idea uh, what the judge is thinking regarding the, uh, the the charges. That's a great point, and you know, oftentimes, you know, strategically, attorneys in these cases, it's a it's an opportunity to look at the other side's. Cl- a sneak peek of their closing argument. Uh, any cameras, traffic cameras involved in this, Matt? Any video evidence? 
sell those uh i know our well body cam footage we don't there's not a traffic camera at that intersection and so and i and i'll just kind of go on about this a little bit more again you know i'm not being critical of the judge this was his decision to make and we and got I, that and i still have a lot of respect you know Here we go. this doesn't change that he, he makes tough decisions and um I, I differentiated this is i didn't see this as a case of someone being inattentive and running a red light i i saw that he made a conscious decision to and operate in a Ford 350, a large work truck, to beat a light be, for whatever reason. You know, only he knows why he, he decided to do that. And the, and the amount of time that he had when he saw a yellow light and it went red, he had enough time to, to make it a better decision than the one he made. And, and that, because he made a, a series of bad decisions that were intentional, Alana Williams lost her life. And it was, uh, and it, he, she absorbed the impact of a F-350 in her door and it snapped her neck immediately. So, you know, the, I guess when you're sitting in my, in my shoes and you have to make a decision, those are the things that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And there's no opportunity to retry the case, correct? No, there's not. Right. And uh, the last question I got on a text was, was an accident reconstructionist used yes. in this case? Two yeah, of, good question. Two of them. Ransom had theirs, and, and we also had the sheriff's department because we brought in the sheriff's department because they they have the ability to to look at black spot black box data. Joe Ferretti, appreciate your help on this one. Matt Harvey, good uh, job by, on a difficult situation. I yes, appreciate. I was, it. Th those are the tough days of my job when I have to sit with that family. They're the tough days of my job when I have to sit with the family after. Uh, a guilty guilty verdict as well because regardless their their son or daughter's still gone we recognize there's a, obviously a sensitive situation we're discussing here uh, but so i appreciate the expertise both of you provide on this one matt you're of course returning as a co-host joe we appreciate uh, hearing from you this morning on this and we'll talk to you again tomorrow morning okay fellas have a good show